you very much for that kind introduction, very kind introduction. It takes me back that, actually. i would almost forgotten about that. But, uh, um, in a way, I sort of, it's my job, I think, to sort of do an overview. And you'll see there's an overview of the campaign there. And, um, but I want to talk about how the, the Dardanelles campaign fitted into an overall allied strategy, if there was one. And of course, there's a big question mark there, because um, if more effort, I think, had been put into the Dardanelles campaign earlier, which was uh, which proved to be impossible given the somewhat controversial nature of whether it should take place in the first place, I think it's more than likely that the operation would have succeeded. And I think, and I think at various points, it was interesting rereading Arthur Marder's very interesting chapter, in the first chapter in the book from the Dardanelles to Iran that's just been uh, uh, reissued. But in fact, he takes a rather optimistic line too. This is a kind of road to Constantinople conversion for me, actually, because in the past, I've been rather dubious about whether this campaign had any chance of success at all. And given my normal attitude to Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill, the fact he had something to, to sort of do with it was several reasons why it would probably fail. But um, on looking at it again, and it's often useful to come back to look at things again, I've begun to feel that there were a number of missed opportunities and that in many ways the Dardanelles was probably the best place where we could exert the offensive power of our maritime supremacy. Now, of course, the problem in early 1915 was that the Western Front had stabilized. Well, it wasn't a problem in the sense that the Germans hadn't won, which, of course, was very good from the Allied point of view. But on the other hand, it was quite difficult to actually see uh, a decision being, being, uh, uh, being reached on the Western Front. And the great advantage that the Allies had over the Germans was their supremacy at sea. At the end of the war, the British brought out a, well, the Admiralty brought out actually a secret document to say, well, actually, the Navy has done, had done something in this war. And as it pointed out, the fact that the high sea fleet was uh, trapped in the North Sea, it couldn't get out uh, by the Grand Fleet based in Scottish ports, uh, meant that the Allies had quite a lot of latitude into the way they could use their maritime power. And it wasn't just maritime power defensively in terms of keeping the British Empire and indeed the French in, in, in the war. It was also something that could be used offensively. Now, there was a problem here in that amphibious warfare had kind of faded away um, as a preoccupation for naval officers in general and British naval officers in particular. Um, during the 19th century, from the end of the Napoleon, in fact, even before the end of the Napoleonic War, Battle of Copenhagen, Burning in Washington, this kind of thing, the Royal Navy had, had specialized in what we now call projecting power, in landing troops, bombardment, and so on. And they were very good at it. Uh, and this was the shape of naval operations at various levels throughout the 19th century. But then, and there were technical reasons for this too, it was actually very difficult, particularly as ships became armored and very slow firing guns were developed to deal with them, uh, to actually score hits on ships. Not for nothing did ramming become the preferred tactic, a, a bit desperate. Now, in, eight, in the 1880s, everything changed technically. The advent of the triple expansion engine, the advent of the quick firing gun, the advent of steel as a construction medium, hence you could build high freeboard, sea going, ocean going, warships. This meant that the line of the, 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 the ship of the line had been recreated, if you like, in a new form. And everybody began to concentrate on sinking enemy ships at sea in battles. The term battleship is invented in 1887. It wasn't used before then, uh, although it's often used retrospectively. Um, but uh, this, uh, this, and this demonstrated something of a naval revolution, actually. I, I call it the battleship revolution. And this meant that operations against other ships preoccupy everything, preoccupy the development of gunnery, uh, and also the development of underwater weapons, mines, torpedoes, etc. means that the coastal areas become rather less welcoming for large, 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 large warships. So naval warfare moves out to sea, and everybody tends to concentrate on that. Um, there is very little attention given to combined operations, operations against the shore. And I think that this is a very important background point that needs to be borne in mind. Um, up there I said a doctrinal void, perhaps, question mark. Um, 
Well, not really, in the sense there was a manual of conjoint operations. I think it first came out in 1911. It was reprinted, I think, in 1913. Uh, but am amphibious operations were not the major preoccupation. There was no practice in gunnery against the shore. So, in fact, if you were going to use your sea power offensively, uh, this was something you'd have to learn on the job. Uh, and, of course, this and, uh, and amphibious operations are particularly challenging um, in this regard. Of course, one way you could use your naval power offensively was through blockade. But blockade was very tricky legally. We'd announced that we'd uh, abide by the Declaration of London with a few amendments, uh, which we had designed before the war, that, although it was never actually officially ratified in Britain. Um, in order that we could trade in other people's wars. Now we were rather hoist with our own petard, and, we, and, and, and the limitations which, which we'd accepted in the discussions in, in 1908, I think it was, um, were, were, actually, were actually limiting us. And we soon found, in fact, as Nicholas Lambert has pointed out, that our attempts to, to carry out economic warfare to the knife, if you like, against Germany, were effectively impossible. As with said, I don't want to use the term blockade, in fact, we only get a ministry of blockade in the middle of the war. For one reason, a blockade, and this is, and this is significant if we're thinking of amphibious operations, had to be a close blockade. And this meant, in modern conditions, you had to occupy islands close to the American coast for your light forces, your destroyers in particular, to operate. Hence the fixation with Borkham. Churchill was very keen. His first <coughs> amphibious idea was to go for one of these islands off the German coast, which could be developed into a base for light forces, and we could actually carry out a real blockade that the Americans couldn't grumble about. Because the Americans really did grumble. In fact, they became the kind of referees of the war in the Atlantic. Um, hence the Germans being so stupid when they introduced unrestricted submarine warfare and sank the Lusitania. How to shoot yourself in the foot strategically because American opinion changed. At the beginning, the Americans were very anti-British, as they'd been 100 years before, on our activities in exercising belligerent rights. And in fact, uh, as has been uh, shown, that there was a very interesting conference at Wolverhampton uh, recently, and the, and the speaker pointed out how close to a real Borkham operation uh, was being planned at the end of 1914. But the things... Now... now so Churchill supported a North Sea offensive. Uh, um, Fisher, of course, who'd, who replaced Battenberg as first sea lord, uh, he was very keen on going into the Baltic. Now, this is often thought of as being a rather silly idea, but actually, uh, we had thought of going into the Baltic throughout the 19th century. Admittedly, underwater weapons were that bit more, bit more powerful now, but Berlin isn't too far away from the Baltic coast. And, I, and, and, and Fisher's idea was, let's develop naval forces which will be able to control the Baltic, and then we can bring in a Russian army, and it can advance on Berlin uh, from the Baltic coast. And he did a lot of things to actually help that along. Uh, he, built, he began to build monitors, which would prove useful in the Mediterranean. Uh, he began to build proper landing craft, which, which, uh, which also would prove useful uh, towards the end of the, uh, of the Dardanelles campaign. And he built shallow draft battle cruisers and large light cruisers to operate in the Baltic area. It's an interesting speculation if that would have worked, but, but it's important for our, our purposes in that Fisher's heart was never really in the Dardanelles. He really wanted to use British naval power a bit closer to home. But what about the Eastern Mediterranean, especially after Turkey comes into the war? Is this a potential target? This, of course, is very ironic. We've spent the 19th century protecting Turkey from Russia. We had sent fleets through the, a fleet through the Dardanelles in order to show our support for the Turkish, Turkish Sultan. We, we had an HMS Sultan when the Sultan came to Britain. Our relations with Turkey were quite close. But now we decided we'd change sides in the region, and we were now supporting Russia. And remember, of course, if the Dardanelles campaign had worked, Mr. Putin would now be running uh, Istanbul. So uh, perhaps it's a good thing it didn't, but never mind. We can't read history backwards that much. So, and the, now we come to the Russians. Communication with the Russians was difficult. The transport infrastructure in the Arctic wasn't as great as it later became. We had to be nice to the Swedes, even though they were trading with the Germans, because we had to communicate with the Russians across Sweden and Finland. 
And with the Turks coming into the war, the, the major outlet, single major outlet for Russian exports, grain from the Ukraine, was cut off. And this had serious effects. Uh, it, it, it interfered with the Allies' food security, but more importantly, perhaps, it meant that Russia could not export to earn foreign exchange to import weapons. Cut off through the Dardanelles, Russia was in a, was in a potentially parlous state. And so therefore, although in his usual romantic way, Winston goes on about great Balkan coalitions against the Austrians and this kind of thing, it seems to me, and I agree with Nick Lambert on this, that the, the really major factor was opening up this vital trade route uh, for the Russians. And, in, and of course, giving the Russians Constantinople too. Of course, this created complications because if we were going to use the Greeks, as we planned at first that we might, um, the, uh, the Russians wouldn't be happy. And in fact, the Russians rather vetoed the use of the Greeks, and this made the Greeks sulk. And of course, this had effects um, later when in the conflict between King, King Constantine and Venizelos. Um, I've just been given, as I was saying to some of my colleagues, a poison chalice. I have to talk about the maritime side of the Salonika campaign. Great literature on that like none, but so uh, anyway, that's another point. Now, so, how are we going to do the Dardanelles? That is well known, of course, the plan was that we would, we, we would take the old battleships, supplemented by one or two new ones, HMS Queen Elizabeth, the most powerful battleship in the world at the time, fast, 8 15-inch guns, uh, but its guns hadn't been calibrated yet, let's calibrate them on the Turks. Uh, the Gerben had, of course, played a part in Turkey's coming into the war, the battlecruiser Gerben, so we had to have a battlecruiser of our own to deal with it uh, if we got into the Sea of Marmara, uh, so we send uh, the battlecruiser inflexible. Uh, otherwise, they are pre-dreadnoughts. The French, of course, come along too. They aren't going to allow the British independent action in that part of the world. They have their eye on Syria already. Uh, so, um, the, uh, and so the French sent four pre-dreadnoughts, Bouvet, Charlemagne, Gaulois, and Souffron. But it was a powerful fleet. And by, and, uh, by February, we have got 12 capital ships, admittedly not of the latest type, but that's the idea. These ships are supposed to be expendable. Trying to persuade their crews that they were expendable was perhaps a bit more difficult. And Fisher was apparently a little worried about the loss of crews, uh, but that, I think, was an excuse didn't like the operations in his, um, in his heart. And of course this was a problem because naval officers don't like seeing ships sink. It's very spectacular and it tends to undermine people's confidence. So, uh, and of course it did. So we have the attack on the, on the 19th of February. It was relatively successful. And just to give you some idea, we have four French ships, I mentioned their names, Queen Elizabeth, Agamemnon, Inflexible, Vengeance, Albion, Cornwallis, Irresistible, and Triumph. It's a powerful force. First of all, they engaged the forts at the entrance, and of course, uh, uh, with some success, uh, but not as much as they'd hoped, so they close in, and this is, is a successful attack. The batteries are destroyed, and uh, Royal Marines are landed uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, destroy the uh, the installation. Sometimes said it's a pity, you know, that they didn't stay. But it must be said that we were very worried about their security. And in fact, the Royal Naval Air Service seaplanes flying from Ark Royal, the first carrier Ark Royal, uh, spend a lot of flying hours reconnoitering around this to make sure the Turks don't interfere with this operation. And so uh, the um, and this, in fact, uses up the effective flying hours of the seaplanes, and that was to be, and that was to be um, um, important. In early March, it was decided to exploit Queen Elizabeth's long-range fi fighting power to put her on the western side of the Gallipoli Peninsula and fire over the peninsula into the forts in the Narrows. Uh, this is the, uh, no, a good way of calibrating her guns again. And it was going to be uh, supported by seaplanes. Well, Williamson, who later became a group captain, one of the leading pilots, takes off in his seaplane, and he said it was a beautiful view, you could see all over the peninsula, and then the propeller broke and the aircraft crashed and he was almost killed. Uh, two more seaplanes took off, but the effectiveness of the aerial spotting, and again, you see, this is something that's quite new. 
Seaplane spotting for shore bombardment was something that hadn't really been practiced. Uh, but nonetheless, hits were scored, and the bombardment went on. Uh, and then uh, Agamemnon and her, and her, her sister, uh, Lord Nelson, take part in a, in a, a more direct uh, bombardment in, in the Straits itself. But the, but the results were promising. It was found that the Turks would often stop firing, partly because they were, they were not very strong on ammunition, particularly for their big guns. And here we come to an interesting point. How aware were we of the Turkish ammunition status? Marda argues that, in fact, the Admiralty had, Room 40, had uh, um, decoded a signal from a German officer in Turkey saying that they were very short of ammunition. And this, but this wasn't uh, uh, um, uh, extended to the people on the spot. They didn't know. And this is quite typical, actually, of the, perhaps again, you know, early days of the war, of the somewhat inefficient management of the, of the war. It seems strange by modern standards, but of course this was, remember, we have had everything that's happened since 1915. It, one must, uh, if not sympathize, at least understand why errors like that are made. So, uh, the problem was, of course, that it wasn't the guns necessarily that were the main problem. The main problem were the series of minefields. Now, minesweeping capacity, again, was quite limited. Trawlers, manned by fishermen. Now, they did, apparently, they didn't mind hitting mines, but they didn't like being shot at. Hitting, uh, the danger of hitting a mine was in the contract, and you get compensated for it, but they weren't sure what would happen if you were actually hit by a shell. And this is one reason why uh, they didn't press forward, perhaps, as much as they might have done. In fact, on the 13th of March, gunfire uh, put four out of the six minesweepers in the operation uh, out of action. It's the old problem, as it's often put, isn't it? You know, the guns support the minefields, the minefields prevent the ships being too effective against the guns. Of course, there are guns, big guns in the forts, there are other guns covering the minefields, and there are the infamous mobile howitzer batteries, which make four ships to stay on the move uh, and make, make life very difficult uh, for the fishermen. Um, the, uh, the commander, Carden, Admiral Carden, commander of the Eastern Med, he was coming under a lot of pressure. I think he was very worried. I don't think the majority of British naval officers who hadn't been brought up to do this, they'd been brought up to fight ships at sea. They were worried about underwater weapons in general and certainly operating so close, close to the shore because the Navy had not, on the whole, operated that close, that close to the shore given the great um, uh, change in the nature of naval warfare uh, at the end of the 19th century, the Battleship Revolution. And Carden was under a lot of stress, not helped by a lot of hectoring from you-know-who in London. Uh, and finally, his nerve snaps and he has something of a nervous breakdown and he's replaced by Admiral de Robeck, who has a reputation of being quite an aggressive commander. Uh, at the time, although he would soon lose it. So, on the 18th of March, the big attack takes place. Uh, again, a powerful force, led by uh, Queen Elizabeth with, uh, to bombard Charnak, while Agamemnon and Lord Nelson and Inflexible bombard Killing Bar at the Narrows, uh, supported by the battleships Prince George and Triumph. The second line, three <coughs> French, four, four French battleships and two, and two British. And the third wave, four more uh, British battleships. The idea being that the ships would sail up the straits, bombard, and then turn. As is well known, the mine layer Nusret, of which I think a replica is still preserved in Turkey, uh, had laid um, a, uh, a minefield pointing north-south, roughly, or, or down the straits anyway, uh, in areas where it was seen that the British <laughs> bombarding warships turned. And sure enough, of course, Inflexible hit a mine, Bouvet hit a mine first and sank with heavy loss of life, uh, and Ocean hit a mine too, and she sank as well. However, the main Turkish guns had been silenced. And, in fact, the Turks and Germans were panicking somewhat. We know from reports from the other side, the view from the other side, that there was real fear that the British were going to break through, and the French were going to break through. Uh, and if another attack had been made, I think on the 19th, 
uh, it is quite likely that there might have been a decisive breakthrough. <coughs> now you might say, okay, so the fleet gets into the Dardanelles, big gets into the Sea of Marmara, big deal. But remember, the communications of the Turks were largely seaborne. And if you got into the Sea of Marmara, you would cut off the Turks in the peninsula from much of their supplies. This is, this is, this is, this is a synergy that is often forgotten. And I personally think that if the attack had been, had been persisted with, uh, it would have uh, perhaps had some results. But unfortunately, unfortunately, it wasn't. You can see that Cardin, in fact, had been quite optimistic. He said he could go to Constantinople in two weeks. But now de Robert, the new naval commander, uh, uh, he wasn't quite so happy. Churchill, of course, is very critical of him in the world crisis. He says that he couldn't stand seeing his great battleships sinking. Uh, there's a grain of truth in that. I mean, psychologically, it was very difficult to see these ships that had been the centerpiece of the new fleets, which had come along in the 1890s and 1900s, uh, sinking uh, under, the, um, under the underwater threat. There, was a, there were two potential solutions to that. Uh, one was to improve the minesweeping by actually fitting out destroyers as minesweepers. In fact, this had already started. See, the destroyers could move fast. They'd be very hard to hit, unlike the slow-moving trawlers uh, by the by the Turkish artillery, the lighter, the lighter artillery, which didn't have proper fire control. It hit almost by a matter of chance, but it was more easier to hit a slow-moving target than a fast-moving target. Uh, a minesweeping destroyer was much harder to hit, and um, Keyes, Roger Keyes, the chief of staff to the admiral, a very aggressive officer indeed. If you notice, he has very pointy ears. I wonder if he, if he was an alien. He was, so, he was so different to most, from most other British naval officers at the time in his, in his inherent yeah. aggression. <laughs> Um, Keyes uh, pushes for this, but these won't, won't be available until, uh, until some days into April. The other solution, of course, is to turn the campaign on its head and to make the priority uh, some kind of occupation of the Dardanelles. Now, if this, and this, of course, uh, Cardin clutching at straw, uh, sorry, de Robeck clutching at straws, um, is very happy to hear Ian Hamilton. Uh, commanding the what had been the Constantinople expedition before the town, so this is a bit obvious, isn't it? Uh, um, and and was uh, and was renamed. And he says, "Look, yes, I can land." I think Hamilton was after a bit of a campaign himself, actually. But nobody was really expecting, of course, the Turks to respond. And if the attack, if, if it had been possible to actually mount an amphibious operation very very quickly, the Turks were in no position, deployment-wise, to actually resist that. <coughs> and I think at this early stage, it must be. It must be stressed that, in fact, everybody underestimated the Turks. They hadn't done that well in the Balkan Wars, uh, and uh, it, was, um, it was thought that they wouldn't be that difficult to target. Their morale would crack. Personally, I think if the fleet had got through and started bombarding the palace, the regime that was far from strong might well have fallen. Uh, but, uh, of course, it never, got to, never, never quite got that far. So it was decided on the 22nd of March at that fateful, uh, fateful meeting that uh, there would be an amphibious operation. And then Hamilton leaves to organize the campaign in Alexandria. He had to because the forces were all dis well, the forces weren't, 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 weren't properly organized. And this again is a, is, a, is a problem because of this inexperience in amphibious operation. It wasn't like like today, where you have a fully worked up amphibious force, and even then they have to have rehearsals, etc., in the response force task group. Uh, one had to organize this. And actually, I think it was quite a feat of organization. Now, was there a doctrinal void? Well, there was a manual, as I've said already. Uh, I'm not sure how far it had been read. Um, as with all official publications, they tend to spend a lot of time on shelves rather than in front of people's eyes. Uh, and, but, 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 but Hamilton, who'd been chosen, was in fact at least one of the army's amphibious experts. John Lee points this out, actually, in his excellent biography of Hamilton. But in fact, Hamilton, when he'd been uh, General Officer Commanding Mediterranean, Inspector General of Overseas Forces, had supervised, or at least inspected and looked at, been part of, a significant number of amphibious operations, uh, both offensive and, de and defending against them. So he knew as much about, perhaps as little, well, as much anyway, about amphibious operations uh, as any other British officer. And of course, he was a very intelligent guy. I must admit, the more I read about Hamilton, the more I like him, actually. He seems to be quite a, quite a, a likable chap. Uh, but, uh, but the trouble was, of course, he wasn't quite strong enough with 
me, his subordinates. But the problem, and in fact, but his organization, he, he, his, his and his staff's organization of this heterogeneous force of the AEF and the 29th Division uh, into, um, and, the, uh, and the Royal Naval Division, into, an in, into a coherent invasion force. That strikes me as quite the cheap. Uh, but of course, it gave the Turks time to redeploy. And they did. They totally transformed the defences of the peninsula in those weeks. What had seemed to be practical, perhaps in March, wasn't so easy, still perhaps practical, but wasn't so easy um, in April. And when the landings take place, and we come to a generic problem here, the, 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 and I'll keep coming back to this, the, the big problem for amphibious ops as seen at this time was getting the troops ashore. Then you worried about what you did afterwards. And I think that is at the heart of the terrible missed opportunities, particularly at Y Beach, where command wasn't clear. Uh, Hunter Weston, who was in charge, who was the sort of middle management of the operation, was virtually out of touch. We have one of the most frustrating, perhaps the most frustrating uh, incident in a, in a campaign is when HMS Queen Elizabeth, with Hamilton on board, sails by Y Beach. And Key says, look, they're ashore, no opposition. Land the Royal Naval Division that, that had been carrying out a diversionary operation. Land the Royal Naval Division there. And Hamilton says, no, I can't without asking Hunter Weston. And then Hunter Weston says, no, he didn't want to interfere with the, with the existing landings because it would cause too much disorganization. Well, of course, he might have been right. But the fact that you couldn't do that, even when things were absolutely wide open, at Y Beach, and you could have advanced against no opposition, outflanked the Turks at Helles, taken the high ground. It was such a it was such a missed opportunity. Of course, at Anzac, as is known, I mean the the current uh, put the boats. The standard procedure, by the way, was for people to come up in large warships, battleships, and large cruisers. They'd be transferred into boats, being towed by steam picket boats. That was the that was the form of landing. No tank landing craft in those days. Well, no tanks, of course. Um, Although RNAs aren't in cars, and still that's not the story. Uh, and some, in fact, were deployed here eventually. So, and S Beach, again, rather, rather similar on the other side of the, of the peninsula. In fact, in the end, they had to evacuate Y Beach in the end when the Turks eventually came up and counterattacked. But, 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 but one can see, again, this story of, of missed opportunity and the fact that the limited forces that were, I mean, this wasn't the centerpiece of British strategy yet. Well, it might became it to some extent, I'll argue. Uh, with the limited forces available, the limited ground forces available, opportunities were let go. And of course, there were the, 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 the infamous frontal attacks at Cape Helles, on, uh, by the East Lanks in particular, six, six VCs before breakfast, etc., and the famous Rear Clyde, which actually proved quite a useful landing ship. It was armoured, and in fact, it acted as a kind of little, a little fortress. And in fact, the troop, most of the troops on board, on board Rear Clyde got, got ashore at night um, after the expensive first day. Uh, diversions at Kumkali, but times marching, marching on. The Turks, of course, counterattack, and the Turks suffer grievous losses. Um, the, the Turkish losses in this campaign were absolutely massive. Simple frontal assaults, and they were, in fact, uh, defeated with thousands, thousands, and thousands of casualties. So, but we have stalemate ashore. We have another trench campaign. Uh, in fact, trench mortars, although I see we're having something about it, uh, were, hadn't been delivered to the troops because they weren't expecting trench warfare. They weren't really expecting much in the way of opposition at all. Uh, and, uh, but now things have degenerated, if one can use that word, into, into, into a stalemate campaign. And it was thought of, let's perhaps have um, a, new, um, a new naval attack. Um, the... the uh, But what, what put the kibosh on that um, with the, the, uh, in May uh, was that a Turkish destroyer, very daringly, actually reversed down the straits to make it look, look like a merchantman <laughs> and torpedoed the battleship Goliath. This caused quite a kerfuffle back home. The idea of a naval attack had not been <coughs> totally discounted. And right up to the end, Keyes in particular was heckling to have, no, let's try a new naval attack, particularly as he had his new secret weapon, his mind-sweeping destroyers. That was very important. Uh, 
But the scale made sure continues, and then along comes the submarine, both British and German. British submarines made life very, very difficult for the Turks in the Sea of Marmara. They prevent the Turks using a lot of their sea transport. They create logistical difficulties. Troops, have to come, troops and supplies have to come down by train and then have to be carried marching or on mules or whatever further south. And this does create logistical difficulties for the Turks, making again the point that if we've had surface control in that area, things might have been a good deal better still. But along comes U-21 also. And she torpedoes a couple of British battleships. And this causes, again, Russia blood to the head as far as the naval high command are concerned, and off go the battleships, which means the people ashore lose a lot of their heavy gunfire support. And there aren't that, isn't that much artillery either. One problem, you see, is because this, if you like, has, has squeezed its way into British strategic thinking uh, uh, and is being done, in a sense, on the cheap, there are constant shortages of men, of guns, and, of course, the, the, the areas that are occupied are so small that it's actually quite difficult to support the troops properly, even with things like water, for example. So it's a, uh, but can we withdraw? And the answer is, at this stage, no. Um, and, and, and at this point, you get the crisis, you know, it's about the time of the crisis in London, Churchill ceases to be First Lord of the Admiralty, but remember, he does not depart from the center of power. He's Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, and a lot of his biographers say that's a meaningless post. No, it's not. It means you can be in the cabinet, and you can still be a member of what I think significantly is called the Dardanelles Committee, which is effectively the War Cabinet. So now we have the War Cabinet called the, called the Dardanelles Committee. So now the Dardanelles is taking centre stage, and we can't withdraw, because if we do, what will be our reputation throughout the empire? The, the, the Sultan has declared jihad. What about all these Muslims in it? We, we, we cannot have, and of course, quite, quite a large number of Indian troops. In fact, the Anzacs were supported when they first landed by an Indian mountain gun, uh, mountain gun battalion. Only goes to show, you see, they had no artillery of their own. <clears throat> so what has, be, what has begun as a shoestring operation, if you like, has now become the center of what our strategy is as far as the war is concerned. And the forces begin to arrive. Fisher's equipment produced for the Baltic, the monitors begin to arrive, some old cruisers are bulged, so even if they're torpedoed, they won't sink, to act as monitors, uh, firing their six-inch guns against the shore, and everything seems set for another go. And the idea is that Hellas will hold down, 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 down at the tip, but the main thrust will come from Anzac, up the side of the peninsula, and also a new landing will take place uh, at Suvla Bay. Uh, sadly, it's another you know, story of missed opportunities. Very heavy fighting. Uh, the Aussie attack, uh, uh, which is now a picture at the, uh, at the Australian War Memorial, one, one of the two uh, of, of, the, uh, of the attack there. Very heavy casualties to the Australians. Um, uh, but the troops land at uh, some, some, some success though. And, but the troops land at, land at, at, at Suvla Bay. These are new army divisions, which have all the problems of being new. Uh, that commander, of course, is Stopford, who's been chosen largely because of seniority. But he has a chief of staff called Hamilton Reed, who won the VC saving the guns at Colenso. Uh, but in fact, his, his experience on the Western Front has been, you can't advance without heavy artillery support. We haven't got heavy artillery support, so we can't advance even with monitors and things off the, off the beaches. Of course, communication between the ships and the shore was, had, had all the usual com communication problems uh, of, the, uh, of the First World War. Um, and uh, in fact, there were friendly fire incidents, though I don't think the Gurkhas were actually killed by the RN. It would appear they were probably killed by New Zealand artillery battery uh, um, in, uh, in perhaps the most notorious friendly fire incident. Um, but, uh, yes, the troops have gone ashore. Stopford can pat himself on the back. I've done the most difficult thing in an amphibious operation. I've got my troops ashore in a more or less organized way. Isn't that marvelous? Now, what do we do next? Well, what, 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 what you do next is you attack Turks who've only just arrived. And quite often, in fact, was, I think it's on this case that 
After, after about three days regrouping at Suvla Bay, they advanced and were met by some Turks who'd arrived about half an hour earlier. And this demonstrates, you see, the problem of not having amphibiously trained officers who know that you have to move quickly to, to, to exploit the shock effect of your landing. Because the Turks didn't really expect a landing at Suvla Bay. They, they, they were expecting a landing at Bulair, in fact, further up the peninsula at its, at its narrowest point. Churchill was quite fond of that idea, too. Uh, and, uh, and of course he's still in a position of influence as Chan Chancellor of the, of the Duchy of Lancaster in the Dardanelles Committee he leaves though when it's clear that the operation is about to be abandoned uh, so more missed opportunities here uh, and but once I've been looking at the Keys papers recently because of this Salonica work uh, not much in there about that but it's very interesting to see how really quite late on Keyes is saying look Let's have a major operation. Let's have an attack out of Hellas and out of uh, the, be the beachhead that we have further up the peninsula. And we can lead the fleet through, through the minefields, led by the destroyers. And we can control the Sea of Marmara and create merry hell in the Turkish rear and stop them reinforcing. And this is being talked about quite late on. Uh, and... Uh, in a sense, the logic of the importance of the Dardanelles expedition, the way it had, it, what it had developed into, uh, perhaps might have advised that that was a sensible idea. But I think the Dardanelles were becoming a bit of a dirty word in London by that time. It was too problematical. And uh, it hadn't succeeded. A lot of casualties had been, uh, had been suffered. Uh, the, uh, um, it, 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 it seemed less worth the candle. And of course, Kitchener... Um, who, whose attitude to it deserves a bit of study in itself, actually. Uh, he, um, he actually was, uh, uh, became more and more in favor uh, of, of, of withdrawal. And he comes out and they decide to withdraw. Now, is this the greatest missed opportunity of the war? I think it perhaps it was. I never thought I'd say that, but I've been converted the one again, as they say. Um, this, was a, this was a strategically sensible way of exploiting Britain's maritime power and allied maritime power. Um, Russia did have economic difficulties. These economic difficulties, which were to some extent hobbling her military effort, these could be solved most easily by opening up the, opening up, uh, the Dardanelles, allowing the Russians uh, to export their grain uh, and to really transform uh, their trading um, their trade. There were also opportunities if Turkey changed sides to actually get some kind of Balkan coalition. Uh, several people in London had, a, had a ideas along those lines. But I think the most important thing was, <coughs> oh, was Russia. The, the problem was that because I think people were so unfamiliar at all levels with the concept of a combined operation, although there'd be quite a lot of worry about landings in Britain, of course. Remember in 1913, Admiral Jellicoe and the enemy fleet had actually landed troops in Britain, which I think is one reason he was made commander of the Grand Fleet, uh, uh, replaced Callaghan, poacher turned, turned gamekeeper. Um, there was insufficient thought given to the dynamics of that most difficult of operations, an amphibious landing. It was all very well having the ships, but uh, you had to have the of the organization. Amphibious warfare had not been top of the Royal Navy's priority, and it had not been top of the Army's priority either, as the Army had turned towards more and more to fighting in the Premiership uh, alongside the French Army. <coughs> um, there'd, been, there'd been a lot of thought given, actually, in the early 20th century to this, but it had rather died away uh, under the influence of people like Henry Wilson, um, because you know, who wanted to fight with the French? And of course, the fact that the Western Front was there, taking up resources, was an important factor as well. Uh, trying to get ammunition for the Dardanelles campaign was quite difficult, when there wasn't enough ammunition for anybody. And it's hardly surprising, therefore, that the amount of firepower available to Hamilton and his, ar uh, and his, and his army was quite limited. Um, Hamilton, of course, didn't know how much his expedition had become a priority. He left London, on, while it was still something of a sort of a sideshow, albeit an important one, he wasn't told, strangely enough, that Kitchener had signalled to uh, the commander in Egypt that in fact he was to send troops to reinforce Hamilton. 
So the, it's, it's a reflection of Britain's rather poor organization for war. Now, the last thing on there is, you know, who was responsible. I'm not sure anybody was personally responsible, although I must admit the more I read about Hunter Weston and Stockford, the less respect I have for them. The more I read about Hamilton, the more respect I have for him. But he should have taken his middle, his middle level commanders in hand, I think, rather more. It confirms my opinion of the shortcomings of the Royal Navy's leadership in the First World War. I remember, and I've often said this, that when I did my chapter in the Royal Navy since 1815 uh, on the RN in the First World War, I was still at Hull then, and I sat back in my chair and said to myself, what a lackluster performance that was. The Royal Navy's officer corps, they weren't dim. Contrary to what Percy Scott said, they were not spit and polish orientated. They were technologists. They were managers of technology. They weren't managers of violence or managers of war. And I think this is part of the psychology. You see this admittedly obsolescent battleship going glug, glug, glug. And that's what you've been all about. Are you willing to take risks? No. It's like Jellico turning away at the Battle of Jutland, but more about that next year. It, 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 is, it is a risk-averse culture. You can see it in the True Bridge and the Gerben in 1914. It's a risk-averse culture. And this isn't the kind of, with few exceptions, notably keys, uh, it's, and it's, this is, isn't the kind of culture that is going to take you into harm's way, particularly close to shore, which was an environment in which the Royal Navy had become less and less familiar. In the 1880s, the Royal Navy had put triple expansion engines into two very interesting warships, the Victoria, that is notorious, having been sunk by the Camperdown in a famous collision, and the Saint Perel. These were fascinating ships. They had twin 16-inch guns in their forward turret. They were very heavily armored. Their task, to penetrate the Dardanelles to relieve Constantinople with the Russians occupying the Gallipoli Peninsula. Rather ironic, isn't it? Some, somebody said, I don't know who, but I came across this somewhere, wouldn't it be nice if we had those old ships? They'd be perfect for this. But that was the old navy. We now have the new navy. <coughs> it's the old learning curve again, in a sense, but we'll be hearing more about that. But, but it was, it was a, 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 I think, the greatest missed opportunity of, of the war. I think that if the ships had got through to <coughs> the Sea of Marmara, turned their guns on the Imperial Palace, I think there might well have been a coup. Uh, and I think Turkey would, might have been knocked out of the war, uh, and I think that the First World War would have taken a very different course. But uh, applying maritime power offensively is a complex operation that requires years of preparation, really, and it, and it requires uh, uh, the development of specialist expertise. The British did not have that. One could, I could understand why they didn't. And it was nobody's fault in particular. It was just the fact that the British Empire was very unprepared for this kind of war. After all, this was perhaps the first proper opposed amphibious landing in history. Uh, my namesake, one of the groves at Dartmouth, told me when, when I said this that actually the Japanese had carried out an opposed landing in the Russo-Japanese War, but I'm not so sure about that. This was a pioneering operation, and you often get it wrong. But if its importance had been recognized earlier, if the preparation for it had been carried out properly, if the element of surprise and shock had been exploited more, something the British are not very good at, actually, then things might have been very different. But they weren't. And now we regard this as a major disaster. Pity, really. Thank you very much. I know where he is. I know where he is. If you want to find the private, I know where he is. He's hanging on the old barbed wire.